Let me invite you on a journey. We're going to be in the book of James, and we start that today. So you need God's Word, and you also need the communion set. So you have a communion cup and a wafer that I hope you got when you walked in from one of our awesome deacons. And we're going to take communion at the end uh, of our service. Uh, we also have these really cool uh, books, the book of James for note-taking. So it's like James is in here, the, the letter of James, and then you can take notes as well. So they tell me these are available in the foyer if you want those. I think Marlena will talk more about that as she closes out our service today. So we have something in our church life rhythm called a summer teaching series. And each summer we begin what we call the summer teaching series around June. Last year we did the book of, uh, we did the Kings. Remember that? The Kings. And then the year before that, we did something called summer playlist. We did the Psalms. And so each summer we take, you know, the time of summer to teach a book of the Bible and ask God to honor it and bless it and grow us up. We also use several of our pastors. So we've got a, a preaching team that will be uh, coming alongside me and I'll, I'll preach a line share of the messages, but we'll have other men as well at North and Central. And so I can't wait to dive into James. And so we'll, we'll start today in James chapter one. So find that in uh, your, your New Testament. And this is first message, day one, as we walk through the book of James, the letter of James together. By the way, you may have not known this, but James is the oldest book in the New Testament. So often we think, no, that's Matthew because Matthew is first. The Bible is not written chronologically, you know, as you see it in your copy of God's Word. So we believe that James was the earliest letter. So we're studying really the oldest book of the New Testament. And many of us, you know, we love the book of James it's so, it's so practical. It's, it's just, uh, it's much like the book of Proverbs. Someone called it. Someone said, James is the New Testament book of Proverbs. And, you know, James is going to challenge us not just to, to read the word and grow in knowledge. He wants it to impact our life. So you know that when God gave you his word, he did not give you the Bible just so your knowledge would increase. He gave us his word so that our lives would be changed. So we just don't want to come to Christ's place and open our Bible and study, 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 and it not impact our marriage and it not impact our thought life and it not impact our work life. We want to live out God's truth every time we open up the word of God. The book of James is not about how to become a Christian. It's about how to behave as a Christian. So this book will mature you. It will grow you up in your walk with the Lord. There are 108 verses in James. So it's a small letter, just five chapters. And with the help of God, we're going to touch every single verse in our summer teaching series. And, and, the, and, the, and the writing of James is clear. It's direct. You'll never read James to say, oh, what did he mean by that? You'll never scratch your head and wonder. He's clear. One of the reasons that he's so clear is he gives imperatives. Do you know what an imperative is? An imperative is a command. It's like, you do this. And he gives 60 of them. So he, he is so crystal clear with these imperatives. And he tells us how we're, to, how we're to live. He really will confront our faith to see if it's genuine. If I could just put it bluntly today about James, it's almost like a punch in the face. And I am doing a terrible job to you know, roll out the first message in James. And here I'm saying, it's a study about a punch in the face. You're like, I'm not gonna come back again, but let me soften it a little bit and say this. In Proverbs, there's a scripture that says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. So think about it like that. Because James is a pastor. You'll hear me say a lot, Pastor James, Pastor James. He is a loving pastor. And sometimes 
The most loving thing someone can do for you is to tell you the truth. Even when you don't want to hear it and it's uncomfortable and at times it will get a little uncomfortable in this series. He's going to take head on favoritism. Do you show favoritism? Do you run in clicks? Do you look down on people that may not dress like you or drive like you? I'm telling you, if you play favorites, you're going to get uncomfortable in a few Sundays because he is going to get real direct about prejudice and favoritism. Are you in a conflict with someone in your family or friend right now and you're at odds with them? He's going to deal with conflict. How many of us might struggle with the words that we use? We might talk about people, tear people down, hurt people with our words. We are going to see a very direct passage about our speech. I guess what I'm saying is we all need the book of James. You know why we need the book of James? Because this is what James said in chapter three. He said, if you can control your speech, you're a perfect person. And I ain't that. And you're not either. So we all stumble. Matter of fact, James says in James 3, 1, he says, for we all stumble. And when I read that, uh, that convicts me and comforts me. It convicts me that I stumble, I sin, but I am also comforted to know that I'm a fellow stumbler like you. So we're all in the stumbling class this summer and we all need God to help us. We all need to be challenged and encouraged. And at times we need to get uncomfortable. I heard this when I first started preaching. They said, here's the job of the preacher to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. So that's really my role, you know, to give comfort to those that need it, but to also give discomfort if me and you today need to repent of some stuff and we need to begin to live out God's truth. You know, I believe that every book of the Bible have a key verse and I'm going to suggest that the key verse of the book or the letter of James is James 1.22. Do you know James 1.22? You might want to just look at it real quick with your eyeballs. James 1.22, this is what it says in the letter. It says, be doers of the word and not just hearers only. So that's what we want to do in the letter of James. We want to do the word. We want to obey the word and not just hear the word. And if this happens, can you imagine the transformation that's going to take place that will be noticeable for the people of Christ's place? So today we are in James 1, 1 through 12. Look at God's word with me. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God promised to those who love him. We just heard the word of God. So next Sunday, we'll pick up at verse 13. And right now we're going to explain and apply verses one through 12. If you look at verse one, we see who wrote this book. His name is James. Now, 
there were a lot of men named James in the New Testament. So if you were to see a group of people and say, hey, James, 17 guys would turn around, you know. It was a prominent name. But we know exactly who this James was. This James was the brother of Jesus Christ. So we know at Christmas, we talk about the virgin birth of Christ. Jesus was born to the Virgin Mary. She had a husband named Joseph. Now, later they got together and had more kiddos. So we know, according to the gospel of Matthew chapter 13, they had four more sons and at least two more daughters. So they had seven kids in that family. You can just see Mary right now driving around in a minivan in Nazareth, right? She had a lot of kiddos. So they had a big family. James was number two. So the oldest is Jesus, second in the family would be James. You know, there's a thing called second child syndrome. Anybody have that affliction? You know, you are in the shadows of an older brother, an older sister, you know, and you feel that pressure because you're not the oldest. Can you imagine being the younger sibling of Jesus Christ? Can you imagine what the mother would say? Why can't you keep your room clean like Jesus? Why can't you clean your plate like Jesus? Why don't you keep up with your homework like Jesus? And so he felt, you know, this intense pressure, I'm sure, growing up in the home of Jesus. Can I shock you today? Did you know that James was not a believer when he was younger? You know, just because you grew up in a Christian home doesn't automatically make you a Christian. I hope all the young people hear me right now. When you saw Stella baptized, you need a relationship with Jesus as a little girl or a little boy. It's not good enough just to have a dad or a mom that loves God. You must love God. And so James was not a believer in Jesus Christ, nor was his siblings. Look at this scripture on the screen, John 7, 5. For not even his brothers believed in him. So when Jesus was doing his ministry, his brothers and sisters would follow him around and they did not believe he was the son of God. Can you imagine that? But there came a time that James became a believer. You'll find it in 1 Corinthians 15 and 7. It says that after Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he walked the earth for 40 days and he saw lots of people. And one of the ones he went to, James. He went to James and James in that moment became a born again follower of God. He began to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you remember a moment in life that you were not following Jesus and you began to follow Jesus? If you're not following Jesus, I'm so proud you're here. I can't think of a better place for you and your family to be than Christ's place because that's what we're all about, how to follow Jesus and how to keep following Jesus. So James became a follower and he began to grow fast. I love to see that as a pastor. I love to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ and then watch them accelerate in their growth in the Lord. And quickly James rose to quite prominence in the church. He was the first pastor of the very first Christian church, the first uh, gospel church. Acts chapter two, there's a church called Jerusalem. It's the very first church in all the New Testament. And he was the uh, lead pastor, for lack of a better word. He was the leader. And so think about this. I might, might, matter of fact, he's called the pillar of the church in the book of Galatians. So here's this guy. He didn't believe. He grew up in the shadows of Jesus. He became a Christian. And now he's a leader in the church. But you know what's just like shocking to me? He doesn't mention any of that in verse one. Did you notice that? When you look at verse one, he is not being a name proper. There's no bravado. Look how, look how he identifies himself. Look again at verse one, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you do that? I mean, if you had that pedigree, that background, if you had that bank account, if you had that GPA, if you had that great physical attractiveness, would you strut your stuff or would you just say, I'm a servant of God. I'm a servant of Jesus. He's teaching us something. 
He's teaching us that we're all servants. And when you view yourself as a servant of God, it will keep you out of trouble. See, what happens to us when we fall into temptation, and that's next week, by the way, talking about temptation. The reason we fall into traps and temptation is because we think highly of ourselves and we don't remember that we're just simply servants of God. And how awesome James starts this letter by saying, you know, I've got a lot of credentials and a lot of background, but ultimately all I'm about is Jesus Christ. Look who he writes to in verse one, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Then he says, greetings. So who is this? You know, if you know your Bible, 12 tribes, you're probably immediately thinking about the 12 tribes of Israel. So what does James mean by this? He's just writing to Jewish Christians. Now, some letters in the Bible, they were written to a local church. Like Corinthians was written to a church at Corinth. And... um, The book of Thessalonians was written to a church called the church at Thessaloniki, so a a local church. But James was a circular letter. It was written to all believers. And the dispersion is a word means they were scattered all around. And that's me and you. We all live in different places. Some of you live in Gwinnett. Some of you live in White. Some of you live in Barra. Some of you live in Jackson. Some of you wherever you might live, Hall County is lots of us. We're all scattered around. We live in different neighborhoods. We go to different places. And so this letter is for us today. It is for believers that are just scattered everywhere. But specifically, these believers were going through difficulty. So they're scattered believers, but they're not shielded believers. See, we're scattered all around, but there is no promise in the Bible that we will be shielded from the subject today of trials. You'll never find God shielding you from trials. God's love is not a pampering love. It is a perfecting love. And so we, we will have our share of trials. And, and I'll tell you, it's just something how James is like starting with this. He doesn't ease into it. I mean, I'm thinking about most pastors, most communicators, if they have something hard to say to the congregation, they'll kind of ramp it up for two or three Sundays. But James, I mean, he just like, he like jumps right into trials. When I was a kid, we used to go tubing. This is like in uh, North Florida, is this place to tube called Itchitetney Springs. And it's the coldest water. And I'm gonna tell you, if you're gonna ever tube in the Itchitetney, you, you just don't like put a foot in or toe in. There's only one way to enter the Itchitutney. You dive in. Because if you don't jump in that water, you'll never get in that water. So here's James. He's talking about a very direct subject and he just like plunges into trials. Verse one, he says, I'm a servant. Verse two, he says, we got trials. We got trials. And I love that because, you know, pastors, they tell the truth to their people. If you're ever under a pastor and he never teaches from an open Bible, we got a problem. If you got a pastor and he's always dodging around subjects that might be hot potatoes and controversial, we've got a problem. James is a loving pastor and he's very direct and he tells the truth and he's talking about something that everybody that read that letter could understand, trials. So let's talk about trials today. And here's our outline. It's built around questions. We're gonna take communion after the message. So pay attention. It's gonna get you ready for communion. Here's the first question. Who goes through trials? Who goes through trials? You do. And I do. Look at verse two in the scriptures. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Notice I emphasize when because it's not if it's when so trials are going to come trials are not an elective course they are a required course you get no immunity from trials no exemptions from trials no one lives a trial free life is what I'm trying to say and we got some wonderful Christians in this room that pray and serve God and faithful, but they also will have their share of trials. I love how he starts with that because he blows up this illusion that a lot of us have. We have this fairy tale that we 
look at someone's life and we'll say something like this. You ever done this? By the way, it's immature to do this. Grow up and stop doing this. But it's immature when we do this. I wish I was him. I wish I was her. Look at their life, it's perfect. Every picture they take is beautiful. It's called filter. I wish I, I, wish I was them. They go to Disney every Tuesday afternoon. You hadn't seen their credit card bill. You would not want to be them. I wish I was that couple. They're always holding hands. Lubby, 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 baby. You don't know that they fight like cats and dogs and we don't see them. See, we're always envying other people because we think they live a trouble-free life. That's immature thinking. You just don't know that they're in a hot mess right now. And anytime you envy someone's life because you think they have it made, you're being deceived. Another reason I like how James jumps into trials because he's blowing up this narrative that we, that we believers live this perfect life. See, sometimes Christianity gives this message, become a Christian and you'll win, win, win. And you'll never struggle and you'll never have a migraine and you'll never have a hard day. And when we say that, we're lying. And when we say that, we're drawing attention to ourselves and not God. See, we don't want folks to think we're struggling because we want to be some role model that you follow me. I'm not to follow you and you're not to follow me. We're all to follow Jesus. And anytime you go through a trial, you are drawing attention to God, not yourself. And it is God who helps us in our trials. We have nothing to offer. We are not sufficient in ourself. Paul would write this in Corinthians. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God who has trials. I do, you do. And it's not if you're gonna be in one, it's when you're in one. Look at the type trials. He says, you'll meet trials. The word means fall into them. You ever fell into a trial and it was just like unexpected? The word meet there or fall into trials, it's the same word that uh, James's brother Jesus used. You remember this story? You're gonna remember it and I'll tell it. So there's this man and he's on a trip and he's traveling down the Jericho Road and while he's traveling down the Jericho Road, a bunch of thieves ambush him and a good Samaritan helps him. We all remember the story. So Jesus used the word that this man fell among thieves. He got ambushed. Same word his kid brother James is using, that you can be having this blue sky, picture perfect, peach fuzzy day, and bam, a trial comes and they ambush you. And it's happened to all of us. A phone call can change everything. You know, when I was talking to Jason yesterday, he's like, he got up wee hours of the morning to get a drink of water, went downstairs. He's going back up the stairs, getting in bed, notices some people maybe at his door, saw some heads or something, heard a door knock, opens the door. It's the police saying, your son has just been killed. I'm telling you, an email, a phone call, a knock can ambush you. Notice he says these trials are various. What does the word various mean? It means uh, multicolored, variegated. It means that trials come in all types of colors. You've got the red trials of clash and conflict. You've got the blue trials of anxiety and depression. You've got the yellow trials of disease and death. You got the black trials of tragedy and trouble. And you're in one right now. Physical trial. Who's in a physical trial right now? You got cancer. Or you just learned you got cancer. You're going through some treatments and they're making you sick as a dog. Or you got chronic migraines. Or you got a back issue. Or you need to get into the doctor. And in this crazy post-COVID day, you know, you schedule a doctor appointment and you go in April 2025, you know. It can get frustrating. It's a trial. And by the way, I really want to pastor you well in your trials. Because I know that every Lord's Day, we gather as saints at Christ's place. There's some of you going through it. And believe me, I am praying that I will be sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And I will minister to your troubled heart from the Word of God. Physical trials are real. Emotional trials. Some of you go through depression 
Christians get depressed. Believers have issues with mental illness. You can pray, give, serve, do your hear journal every day and still have depression. Charles Spurgeon was this great preacher that we quote a lot. Maybe you see his quotes on social media and he struggled with depression. You know what he called depression? You know what Spurgeon called it? He called it a black dog that followed him. He wrote incredible books. He was a mighty preacher of the word of God. But he said, every day I'd go to my study to write a sermon, the black dog of depression would follow me. It's a trial, an emotional trial. Some of you have some family members you're not speaking to. Some of you are estranged with your dad, estranged with your mom, not speaking to a sibling. Some of you are going through maybe a spiritual trial Spiritual trials are real. We call it spiritual warfare. You know, I'm about to take a, a few weeks to get away that I'm very thankful each summer you allow my family to do that. And during that time, I, I rest, but a lot of it, I spend time in prayer thinking about our next teaching series for the future. And there's one that's just so pressing my heart now to talk about spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is real. And the enemy, Satan, despises you. If you were in quicksand, he'd just pat you on the head today. He wants to take you out. He wants to execute you. And so these spiritual trials come at us left and right. We just finished camp. Every camper at student camp had a trial. You can have trials when you're younger. You can have trials when you're older. I'm trying to tell you that what I'm teaching about, no one is exempt. James says, we all face trials. I think what really helps believers is when you're in one to not be shocked. Oh, I'm in a trial now. How do I get rebaptized? You don't need it. You don't need to be rebaptized just because you're going through hell sideways. That's not gonna make your trial go away. Water in the baptistry don't wash away trials. Oh, I need to get saved again. Jesus said, be born again. He did not say be born again and again and again and again and again. That sounds like a spiritual auction, auctioneer. And so you're born again once. We have assurance of salvation. You can't lose your salvation. But when you're going through a trial, it will make you doubt. It will really make you doubt. I mean, does God love me? Does he hear my prayer? So that's why another writer named Peter wrote, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Boy, I'm glad that verse is in the Bible because a lot of us, it can just really make our spiritual equilibrium get weird. We can get spiritually wobbly because we're thinking I'm doing everything right, but I have a trial. I thought, you know, Jesus got me out of trouble. Sometimes Jesus gets into trouble with you. He enters your trouble and he's gonna use it for a purpose. And so James is gonna say in verse nine and 10, if you're poor or lowly, you have trials. If you're rich or wealthy, you have trials. We all do. Question two, question number next, write it down. Why do we have trials? We need to know why. Because see, when you know the process that God uses in trials, it's gonna eliminate a lot of frustration and you're gonna be able to realize there's purpose. Look at verse three. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So a real key word here is this word, no, no. See, when you know something, it will determine how you respond to it. The worst decisions you can make and I can make is to make them blind. But when you have the facts, when you know the information, when you see the numbers, when you see the plan, when it's written out, you can make good decisions. So it's the same with your walk with the Lord. You need to know things because it will help you in how you respond to what you're going through. It helps you think correctly. And one thing about trials that you need to know is that God uses them to grow us up, to mature us. They produce valuable things in our life. Here's a statement that really, really helped me as I was getting ready to teach you James 1, 1 through 12. Here it is, write it down. We just don't go through trials. We also grow through trials. You need to know this because if you're not, you're gonna get mad at God. You're gonna be mad at everybody else. You need to realize that we all go through them and the goal is to grow through them. 
You can't avoid him, but you need to be intentional about getting everything you can out of that trial. Now, what is the message of the world? Get out of there. Go catch a plane. Go to an island somewhere. Get under a palm tree and uh, you'll have no more troubles. But I'm going to tell you, when you get under that palm tree, you're going to hear that trial say like Adele, hello. (laughs) That trial's going to find you. That wasn't a bad Adele impersonation, by the way. (laughs) That just came to me in the moment. I didn't even do that in the first service. I appreciate you humoring my stupidity. But anyway, and so your trial will find you. No matter, you cannot run. See, many of you try to escape. I see that so often. I'm gonna bail out of this relationship. I'm gonna leave this church. We're gonna move to another neighborhood. But your trials and your stress will find your new address. There's a paraphrase of this passage. It's called the J.B. Phillips translation. It is so good I had our tech team put it in front of you. Look at it. When all kinds of trials crowd into your life, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. Realize that they come to test your faith and to produce in you the quality of endurance, but let the process go on until that endurance is fully developed and you will find you have become believers of mature character. I love this. I love this translation when Philip says, don't resent trials, welcome them as friends. So we're talking about friendly trials now and how God can use a trial, though it may irritate you and not be what you want, God can use it in a friendly way. And that's what it means in verse two, count it all joy. Look at that, count it all joy. So that's how we can have joy in our trials. He's not saying that trials are joyful. He says we can be joyful in our trials. How is that possible? Your relationship with Jesus Christ. Because see, joy is never circumstantial for a Christian. Joy is relational. So if you have Jesus in you, you also have joy in you because he gave you his joy. So no matter what you're facing, you can worship, you can praise, you can pray, you can lean in, you can trust. It is not your strength, but God's grace and Christ's joy that is fully working in your life. And so John, uh, James rather, is telling us that we need to count it all joy. I love that word to count. It's a good word to count. I think about that guy on the Muppets that counted, right? I'm gonna count. And so the word count there, it means uh, it's, a, it's an accounting term. If any of you math accountants out there, it's an accounting term to add things up on the asset column. It does mean that. But also the word count means to look ahead or to think forward. It's like you going on a trip this summer, you, you have to count things out. You have to make reservations uh, through VRBO. You want to check out TripAdvisor and see how all the negative people are still negative about every place. Uh, You want to go to the bank and get some cash. You want to call your credit card company and say, we will be using our plastic hardware in this state, this place. You plan, you count, you look ahead as you take this journey. So when you're going through a trial, you count it joy. You look ahead, you look forward. What do I have to look forward to? I'm in a terrible trial. Heaven, eternity, no more suffering. Remember Romans 8? For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. So never forget that when you're in a trial as a believer, it is always temporary. There is no eternal trial for the people of God. They don't exist. They're all temporary. Paul would write again in Corinthians, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So when you're in a trial, this helps you with joy. This is not my permanent condition. Something awaits me. Glory awaits me. This suffering, it's only temporary at best. And so that's why we can be joyful. We look ahead. He mentions that we're going through a test now. Look at verse three, that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. 
Put your eyeballs on the word faith. We see that a lot in the New Testament. Here's something a little different about this word faith. There's no object here. So it's not have faith in the word, have faith in Jesus. It's a standalone word, faith. So what does it mean? It means your Christian experience. So when you're going through a trial, it is a test of your Christian experience. It's a test of, are you really a believer or have you just been kind of like talking like one, playing like one? So I've been a pastor. I've been shepherding flocks for 29 years of my life. And over the 29 years that I have pastored people, I've seen people go through a trial and they get mad at God and they say, is this what it means to walk with God that I'm dealing with? No way. If this is what it means to walk with God, I walk away. I walk away. I'm gonna say this in love. If you walk away, you never had a walk to begin with because a trial will always reveal if you do have a walk. We believe in the perseverance of the saints. Why do we believe in that? Because the Bible teaches that, that the, that the elect will endure, that the redeemed will not fizzle out before the finish line. You will be faithful to the very end. No matter how hard and difficult it will be, you will not fizzle out. And so how do we know if our faith is real? We gotta have test. A trial is a test. A test is a trial. And so God will bring a test in your life because it will test your faith. Here's a great statement. It's worthy of you writing down. A faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. How does God know he can trust you as a man or a woman or a young person that just came back from a great week of camp? He'll put a trial. Any students right now, you had that glorious camp week, that awesome camp week. Have you had some trials the last week? I mean, you're not in your small group at night. You're not around other believers. You got your phone back. It's a test. It's a test to see, is it genuine? Is it real? And so God will use tests in our life to see if our faith can be trusted. That word testing, you know what it means? It means smelting. What is smelting? Well, it's somebody that works with metals and the heat is like intense. And they'll take these metals under intense heat and anything that's impure will burn off and what you'll have left is gold and silver. And so God at times will take you through the test to burn stuff out of your life that you don't need. And, and the only way it can leave your life, you, it's gotta have some heat come to it. A trial has to come to it. A test has to come to it. Remember when you were in school, you had tests? Listen, if there's one thing I did not like in school, taking tests. I have something called test anxiety. Does anyone have that? I get very anxious about tests. Those people that can just like not study and walks in the room and take a test and make a great grade, I don't like them. I don't. I hope they get a pie in the face or something like that. I, I, I mean, I struggle, you know? And I remember when I was in, uh, when I was in graduate school, I had a professor, his name was Dr. J. Terry Young, and he was notorious for giving pop quizzes. And they were hard. You know how many questions on his pop quiz? Three. So if you felt, if you just miss one, you might as well just jump off a bridge. If you just miss one of that man's pop quiz, you're a goner. And he'd give them, and he's dead. He's with the Lord now. I don't know if he got rewarded by God with all those mean pop quizzes he gave. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But I know this. You know what he taught me to do? Study. So I'd take copious notes in class. I mean, anything that man said, when he would like, <clears throat> I wrote down, cough. I mean, I wrote it all down. Because when the pop quiz came, baby, I'm going to be ready. I'm going to be ready. And so I had to learn it the hard way. Why do teachers test to see if you know the information? Why does God bring tests and trials? To see if you're a growing Christian. I say this in love today. I say this in love that God will bring tests in your life to see if you're genuine, if you're real. Peter would write, these trials will show your faith is genuine. 
It is being tested as fire test and purifies gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day of Jesus Christ. So when you have those tests, you know what they produce? Steadfastness. It's right there in the text. Do you see it? He says in verse three, that through the test of your faith, God uses it to produce steadfastness. What's the word steadfastness mean? It means staying power. It means to endure. It means to persevere. It means to be strong. And sometimes the only thing that will strengthen your prayer life is a trial. Sometimes the only thing that will strengthen my walk with God is a trial. We don't grow in ease. We grow in tension. That's why we like movies so much. You will yawn and fall asleep if there's not tension in the movie. What perks you up? What makes you want to see that movie again and again and again? The tension, the conflict. And God is writing a story of your life. God is producing a movie of your life and he brings in trials and he brings in tension and he brings in conflict. And that's when we grow the most and we learn endurance You'll never grow up until you learn to persevere. Here's a great statement. When we endure, we mature. When we endure, we mature. Quitters don't ever grow up. People that walk away from relationships, people that walk away from hard things, people that walk away from trusting God, there's never maturity in their life. The way you grow up is you learn to be steadfast. You learn to endure. And God has a goal in verse four. He says, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect, time out. Don't let that freak you out. I know when you see the word perfect, it makes us all scared. The word means mature. That's what it means. So when, when you pass the test and you endure, God is gonna grow you up and you're gonna be complete and you're gonna be lacking nothing. God always has this goal. The goal for God is always in the area of spiritual maturity. God is always wanting to grow us up. And at times we as believers, we're not growing. I don't know if that, I, I don't wanna meddle, but I wanna be blunt like Pastor James. Some of you are not in a growth posture right now. You can go days without being in the word. You used to do hear journals. You, you, you used to lean into the Lord. You le- used to listen to way more praise and worship music. You know, you know who you are, but now you've gotten cold. You know, you're not, you're not growing. You're not trusting God. And you know what God will do anytime that happens in our life? Get ready, a trial's coming. And God will use a trial to grow you up. And when he does, he's gonna use you in someone else's life. See, your trial will become your testimony. Your mess will become your ministry. That's why we need to persevere because there always will be trials at Christ's place. And who do the people, who do we go to when we're going through a trial? We go to those people that have endured and they have persevered. I was thinking about that this morning in our deacon prayer time. So our deacons pray over me before I preach on Sunday. And we, we, the Chris Burroughs deacon team prayed over me. And man, they were just praying these beautiful prayers for you, know, for, you for the Your Place folks, for the Nay family. And, and they were going around the room, going around the circle. And, he, and here's Kenny Pope, one of our deacons, praying from a wheelchair. And I'm thinking about this, this prayer that, that Kenny prayed. I mean, just spirit-filled, anointed. And I'm thinking, man, if that is an example of a brother that has persevered in adversity and affliction and difficulty and, and how he is staying steadfast, he is standing strong from a wheelchair. He can't literally stand, but he's strong as he sits. And what do we do when, when we go through trials? It's those people like that that become the ones that we go to to say, how are you doing this? Encourage me, pray for me. Do you see that God always has a bigger picture in mind when you go through a trial? He's gonna use it in somebody's life in a monumental way. So we've answered one question, who has trials? We all do. Why do we have trials? It's always about maturity and creating endurance and steadfastness. But let's finish this last question and we'll have communion. What do we do in trials? What do we do in trials? Look at verse five. He says, uh, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. And so what James is saying, when you have a trial, this is what you need to do. You need to pray. Trouble gets people praying. 
Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever noticed that you can be like days without praying, but then let something happen to you and you start praying? I'm telling you, some of the most powerful prayers that I've ever prayed as a believer is when I see blue lights in my rearview mirror. Man, I'm like praying the Lord's Prayer in English, Spanish, and Swahili all at the same time. Speaking in tongues, you know, I'm telling you, looking, that will get you praying. I have never had anybody tell me in a crisis, don't you pray for me. I'll call people, I'll visit people, I'll say, can I pray? And they'll say, please, Pastor Jeff, please pray. And I'll tell you something too, and I notice when I'm, I'll tell you something too, I notice when I'm praying for people in trouble, they're, they're weeping as I'm praying. And there's just something about trouble that will make your old callous hard heart tender. You know, God will do anything to tenderize our hearts. And so when you're going through a trial, James, he is pastoring us here. He is discipling us. And he's telling us when you get swept off your feet, get on your knees. Now, let me tell you what we've done. James 1.5 is a very well-known verse and we make it a standalone. We all like pray James 1.5, right? But if you notice, James 1.5 is between four and six. So there's a context to this great verse. It is a prayer for wisdom in trials. And what you're doing is you're asking God for perspective. Because see, this is what I need when I'm going through a trial. If I'm not careful, I can get bitter. I can get jaded. I can get angry. I can become inward. I can isolate myself. This is why I need God's wisdom so God can give me a bigger picture of what he's doing. And I can see that there's a process involved here. So there are, there are 14 words for prayer in the Bible. And James uses the easiest word for prayer. It's the word ask. So of all the words he could use for prayer, he just uses the one syllable word, ask. I love that because whatever trial you're in, it might be so complicated, but all you need to do in your trial right now is ask God to help you. Ask God to intervene in your life. The word ask means that an inferior is asking a superior for something. And when you're in a trial, you realize you ain't God. You've got clay feet. You put on your britches just like everybody else puts on their britches. And there is no solution to this problem. And there's no answer to this trial other than going to Almighty God. And if there is a trouble you're going through and it's getting you praying, it's a good thing. I know this sounds strange, but... Bless you, cancer. Bless you, financial reversal. Bless you, physical illness. Bless you, Alzheimer's that has come to our family. Bless you, disappointment. How can we bless those terrible things if they get us calling on God, if they get us back in church, if they get us in the word, if they get us turning to God and asking him for wisdom, we can say, bless you, broken rose. Bless you, broken trail, because that's exactly what God used to bring you back to where you needed to be. You're asking him for wisdom. And wisdom there means that you want God's perspective in this situation. And God will give it every time. How does God give wisdom in verse five? He gives it generously without reproach. The word generously means outstretched arm. That's the word picture. So if you're sinking in a trial, you can see the Lord with an outstretched arm and he's reaching out to give you wisdom. It also means setting a table. So maybe you feel like you're starving to death and you're, you're just impoverished right now and you just want God to feed you some help in this trial. Look at the table that God has spread that you can feed on his word and he will give you wisdom. And then he says, ask. And when he said that, it's an imperative, right? It's just what Jesus said in Matthew 7. Remember Jesus said, he said, ask. And uh, he said, seek and knock. Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. So this is a principle that, that Jesus taught that now James is teaching that God gives grace and God gives wisdom even in our worst trial. It's so fitting that James is teaching us to pray because he was a man of prayer. Maybe you didn't know this. He prayed so much. That rascal prayed so much that they called him, you know what his nickname was? Old Camel Knees. Old Camel Knees. He prayed so much and he was always on his knees. His knees got calluses on him. Because he believed that not only do you just hear God's word, you do God's word. And what do you do? You ask God. You ask God to help in this trial that you're in. Give you wisdom in this difficulty you're in. 
And God will do that. He tells us how not to ask in verse six, seven, and eight. Look what he says. He said, ask in faith, don't doubt. Because if you doubt, you're like a wave in a sea. And in verse seven, if you think you're gonna receive something from God doubting, you're gonna, you're gonna see that you're not. In verse eight, don't be double-minded because if you're double-minded, you're unstable in all your ways. Pause there. We have a choice today, Christ's place. We can be steadfast or we can be unstable. And we're all gonna go through trials. And I'm gonna tell you, the worst thing for someone is instability in their trials, but we can be steadfast. How can we be steadfast? Remember I told you about these imperatives James has always given? There's 60 of them. I'll, I'll, would you do something for me? Would you like right now circle a few words in your Bible? We're getting ready for communion. This will really help you. This will really, really help you when you go through trials. I want you to circle. I did. I, I circled them in my Bible. You can't see, but if they zoomed in, they could see red circles. There's four of them. Count, know, let, ask. They're imperatives. So when you're going through a trial, you count it joy. You consider it rather. You consider it joy. You look ahead that God is at work and this is temporary at best. Glory awaits me. You know you know that God hasn't abandoned you. You know that God has not left you. I taught you this principle a few weeks ago. Don't throw out what you know for what you don't know. Don't throw out what you know for what you don't know. You may not know why you're going through your trial, but don't you throw out what you do know. What do you know? That God loves you, that the Holy Spirit is in you, that God will give you wisdom when you call out to him. And God is using the trial to produce something good, maturity in your life. Let God move, let God work and ask God for wisdom. That's what James is teaching us here. And when we do that, he begins to honor us and he begins to bless us. Ultimately, what trials do is they get us to Jesus. And we gotta get to this last verse, verse 12. W would you look at verse 12? He says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. See, all trials are trail. Do you hike? Do you like nature? Trails always get you to a place. And if you stay on that trail and you don't quit, you get to the vista. You get to the looking place. You are, you're on that trail. And at times it feels like a trial on the trail, but it gets you to where God wants you. And God is taking us somewhere in verse 12. He says that every trial you go through is just getting you closer to home. It's getting you closer to the, to the home place where Christ himself will give you the crown of life. That crown of life given out in verse 12, that is not being delegated to a committee. Jesus Christ himself will give you that crown. Acts 14, says, it is necessary to pass through many troubles on our way into the kingdom of God. James, you know how he died? He died about 15 years after he wrote this letter. They took him and put him on top of the pinnacle of the temple up high. Annas, the chief priest said, deny Jesus. Tell everybody that Jesus is not the only way. He said, I won't do it. I won't do it. And they took him, James, old camel knees, and they pushed him off the top of the temple. He fell to the ground, internal bleeding. Then they pounced on him with rocks and they began to cut his body up. While they're executing him, History tells us that he cried out something. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Who prayed that class? His older brother. <laughs> his brother prayed that. Here's this man, his faith is real. And Jesus, his older brother, rewarded him for his faithfulness. Every trial that you go through is just a trail on your way to heaven. And one of these days when you walk in, Jesus will welcome you. He'll give you the biggest hug. He'll say, you've been faithful. He will reward you. And he will say, welcome to the land of no more trials. No more trials. Now, if you are a Christian today, why don't you listen to this? If you're a believer today, all of your trials are temporary. They're not gonna last forever. Every trial you go through is temporary. If you're not a believer today, every trial you go through is eternal. For the Christian, our trials are temporary and they're getting us somewhere. 
But for the man or woman or the young person that doesn't know the Lord, suffering will never end. That's why you need to come to Jesus today. That's why you need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Is there anyone in this room today or watching online, you would like to become a Christian? How do you become a Christian? Repent of your sin. Put your faith in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Ask him to come into your life. And that moment when you do that and you mean it with all the sincerity of your heart, he comes in and he is with you in any trial you face. Can you think of a better Sunday to have communion than right now? I mean, we've been talking about trials. And what, what is communion all about? It's about reminding ourselves that Jesus went through trials too, didn't he? He suffered intensely to remind us that he loves us. And we're never alone. And what he did for us is gonna usher us in to the kingdom of God where trials will be no more. We're gonna have an altar call. And if you need to come do some praying before we take communion, you can do that. Maybe the Lord used the message in your heart today in a real specific way. And you just wanna come and say, Lord, help me endure so I can mature. Maybe you need to come say, Lord, I'm going through this trial, but I wanna grow through it as well. And just come before the Lord today and ask him for help. Ask him for wisdom. Someone come pray for the Nave family. They need prayer today. You know, always before we take communion, the Bible says we need to be right with the Lord. What did your mama say before you came to the table? Wash your, and you know what the Lord is saying? He's saying to, to come and be clean before the Lord and ask him just to wash us over and Maybe you need to do that today. If you don't know the Lord as your Savior today, I'm going to invite you. I'll be standing down here. If, if you would like me to talk to you for a second, explain how you become a follower of Jesus, you have that opportunity as well. I want you to pray with me. Father, we thank you for James. We thank you, God, that you have taught us today that we're to be servants. And when we go through trials, we're to have joy because you are working in our life to grow us up. And we can look forward to what awaits us. And we ask you for wisdom when we're going through something difficult and hard. We don't want to be full of doubt. We want to be full of faith. And we look forward to the day that rewards will be given to those that have persevered. And so, Lord, today we want to be faithful. Whatever trial we're in now, we, we want to just submit to your Lordship and ask you to help us. Get our hearts ready for communion as well. And we love you, Lord. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen, amen. We're, I'm gonna invite you to stand, would you stand? And we're gonna have an altar call, okay? And so we're gonna have our worship team sing. And if you wanna step out right now, as we get ready for communion, just something you need to pray about, get your heart right with the Lord. If I can pray for you today, you wanna know how to become a follower of the Lord, I'm standing here. So they're gonna start singing and you start moving if God leads you.